What is the point of talking about music if we don't start with one of Letty's most well-known songs? So, vocal polyps allow, I'm going to sing it. <laughs> don't clap yet. <laughs> better seat than a saddle, what better roof than the sky, what better song than the song men sing when hearts are happy and spirits high. Where I much Narelle and Betty for such a fitting welcome to this evening's event. Um, good evening and, and Goomba Malgan, Goomba Nani Gyanindu, Yurigiri State Library of Queensland Goo, which is good evening. It's good to see you here and welcome friends to the State Library of Queensland, which is in Baragam, uh, the traditional language of the community that I grew up on the Darling Downs. And my name is Vicky McDonald and it's my great privilege to be the State Librarian and CEO here at the State Library of Queensland. And on behalf of my colleagues, I welcome you to the State Library of Queensland this evening for our very first Research Reveals event for the year. It's fantastic to have people here in our auditorium, but we're also joined by people who are viewing this evening's event on um, Facebook Live. So welcome, everybody. I would like to begin by acknowledging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and their continuing connection to land and as custodians of stories for millennia. We are inspired by this tradition in our work to share and preserve Queensland's memory for future generations. I'd really like to extend a warm welcome to Dr Stan Mellick, OIMED, and Sally Mellick, Sally Mellick, who are joining us from home this evening. I'd also like to welcome, of course, our very special guest for this evening, Narelle McCoy. And Narelle is a writer, researcher, musician, and lecturer in popular music and of course has just performed with us for us, as well as Betty, the pianist, thank you very much. Uh, Narelle is also the 2020 Letty Katz Award recipient, and this biennial award supports research and documenting of Queensland's music history. It gives a musician, composer, scholar, or researcher the opportunity to study, experiment, and explore new thinking in their area of study. This leads to the creation of new knowledge or work inspired by Queensland's music history. The award commemorates Queensland songwriter and musician Violet Mellick, whose stage name was Letty Katz. This evening, Narelle will share research from her project, Musicians Should Be Heard and Not Seen, The Life and Music of Letty Katz, 1919 to 2007, and her cultural contribution to the Australian music scene. Narelle's project explores the Queensland-born composer's contribution to the national music landscape. It reclaims Betty's position as a successful creator of popular music in an, area, in an era rather, when female composers were rare. Her popular compositions, which include Never Never and A Town Like Alice, offered a distinctly Australian voice in an industry that was dominated by American culture. Letty was the first Australian to have an original song in the popular music hit parade in the 1950s, yet little is known about her. 
Personally, I'm looking very much forward to hearing more about Letty uh, and Narell, um, which Narell will share with us this evening. I encourage everyone to participate in the conversation by sending your questions via Slido, and the, um, the QR code will come up shortly. And the great thing about Slido is you can vote on any other questions and, and they pop to the top, so we can follow that through as well. Um, I finally, I'd like to thank Dr. Stan Mellick and Professor Jill Mellick for their enthusiastic support of the Letty Katz Award and, and also of State Library of Queensland. But for now, if you could please join me in welcoming Narelle to the stage. Over to you, Narelle. Thank you very much. Um, before I begin this presentation, I'd like to thank Stanton Mellick, Letty Katz's husband, who kindly has provided photos and anecdotes, his wife Sally for scanning documents and photos for me, and Letty's daughter Jill Mellick, whose emails have been an invaluable support in my research. She generously has sifted through and posted hundreds of photos to, to Dropbox. Um, she shared anecdotes about Letty and has offered great encouragement to me as a Letty Katz Award recipient. Now, as well, I'd also like to thank Peter Rowenfeld for suggesting I apply for this award. My response to him was, who is Letty Katz? I knew that she was an Australian composer, and I knew that she'd written Never Never because my grandmother sang it. So as soon as I heard the music, I went, oh yes, Letty Katz, of course, but um, there's very little on the internet about her except for some um, articles which I'll show you later. Um, so I was very excited to get the opportunity to come to the library and um, go through Stanton, Mellick and Jill Mike had prepared material for the Letty Katz archive and the Katz family, family archive. So these boxes are absolute treasure troves which I jumped into head first. I've read over 70 years worth of diaries because Letty was an amazing diarist, as well as her travel diaries, which has given me a rare insight into the woman. Now, Violet Katz was born in Brisbane on the 3rd of January 1919 to parents Lucretia and Anton Katz. Her mother, Lucretia, near Pimblet, was from Beaufort, Victoria, where her family had settled in 1850. Her father, Anton, was born on the 22nd of January 1888 near Ostrog, Russia. When he immigrated to Australia in 1914, he anglicised his name to Katz. This slide is a farewell um, photograph that Anton had taken with his nephews and niece. Anatoly, the oldest uh, um, child in the photograph, came to Brisbane and lived with the family for several years. Anton remained close to his Russian family all his life and he sent money um, uh, through New York banks and kept that up until the USSR stopped gifts from uh, outside the country. Anton had been an Imperial Russian in the, um, in the Imperial Russian Army Balalaika Corps, and in the second row he is third from the right. Um, so that's Tsar Nicholas II, of course. Just as a point of interest and, and a bit of a sidebar, I must mention that Anton was a sheet metal worker who made the hands for the City Hall clock. And that's Letty standing with the hands and inscribed on them as the date 1929. Um, so, when I first spoke to Stanton, he stated that Letty was a true aesthete, and I think her upbringing laid the foundations for her development as an artist and a musician. Letty was an only child, and though named Violet, she was only ever called by her nickname. It was a name that was, it, it was a popular song of the day, so she became Letty. Uh, her parents were both musical. I've already mentioned that Anton played balalaika. He also played um, mandolin, and Letty's mother played by ear, the piano. So uh, on the radio program Australia All Over, Letty told the host Ian McNamara that in the evenings there was balalaika and mandolin music being accompanied on the piano. So it was an integral part of their family life. Now, the family settled at 12 Giza Street, Inogra, in an architect design house that Anton had commissioned. I love this house. It's beautiful, it's art deco, and it was surrounded by extensive gardens. Um, there were mature, you can see the palm trees there, the mature palm trees. And when, I, when, when Jill first posted me these photos, I said, oh, they're in the botanical gardens. 
known around. It's the house and their home. So it, it was magnificent. There were hundreds of azalea bushes. Um, there, were, there, were, there was a large fish pond with stones, a grotto, a curved bridge and a fountain. There was a goldfish pond that has particular significance to Letty because, and I hear this on very good authority from Jill, Stanton proposed to her while they were standing by the pond. He always called her the beautiful young woman by the goldfish pond. Um, Lucretia, Letty's mother, uh, was a fine artist who painted and sketched. She actually started um, uh, to do a fresco uh, on the walls of the house, but it wasn't completed. You can see the, the palm trees. They loved, they had a tennis net in the yard. It was a like, beautiful, beautiful, well-appointed place. Letty attended Miss Shearer's kindergarten, the inaugural state school, and then when she was old enough to travel across the city alone, she went to Somerville House. She began her piano studies at the age of five. This is their music room. Um, she studied, first of all, with Connie Hartshorn of Inogra, and then with John Ellis from the age of 11 for many years. I love this photo. She looks so thrilled. Um, she was a talented student, of course. She obtained an MSA from the Australian Music Examinations Board and later her ATCL and her LTCL from Trinity College London. She was preparing for the, birth of, uh, for the birth of her daughter, Jill, so her final preparations for F, her FTCL were interrupted. Now, her interest was not limited to piano. She also learned classical ballet, tap, ballroom dancing with the Pat Mead School of Dancing. She stopped performing um, classical ballet because she thought her foot lacked sufficient arch. And uh, coincidentally, as an old ballet dancer with flat feet, I felt Letty's pain. She assisted with teaching tap dancing, though, and she played the piano for classes. This sh I love this slide. This shows Letty with one of her most prized possessions, her music satchel. She carried this everywhere with her. Uh, I, I like to think she's got lots of ideas in that music satchel. Um, if you've been following my blog, um, in 1938, Anton, with the help of Thomas Cook Agency, took the family first class around the world. And this is a picture of Letty and her mother sitting on the top step there of, um, um, of the SS Moreton Bay. And they went through Europe, uh, the UK and the USA, where they were met at every point by Thomas Cook Agent. Now, the questions I asked of, of both Jill and Stanton was, didn't anyone think it was dangerous to go in 1938 on a world, round the world trip? But Stanton said, no, you know, nobody thought that certainly from Australia everything's fine. And also because they, it was organised by cook tours and, you know, there was no, there was no alarm then. Um, Anton's diary is amazing. He's meticulously recorded um, the, the entire trip. And I found it fascinating to read because the, the, the just his comments about what the world looked like at the time. His lovely description of the Suez Canal with camels and you know, palm trees waving and date palms and people standing and waving on, on the um, banks. Quite different now. Um, this is Lucretia and Letty in London, the slide in front of the columns. I put that in because Letty's taken to London her favourite satchel. So she's obviously still you know, working on ideas. Um, during this trip, they attended the Palladium, the Royal Albert Hall, Sadler's Wells, the Royal Opera House, Covent Garden, as well as the Paris Opera House and the Folie Bergère and the Radio City Music Hall in New York. Um, in the other photo, this is Lucerne, and Letty is actually in Wagner's garden. Now, she was allowed to pick flowers in this garden, um, and she said she pressed them and brought them home. They were a, a great source of pride and joy to her. She was also invited in to play Wagner's piano because people knew that she was a, a musician. Uh, it was a little bit different in another hotel where she'd been invited to play piano and she began to play Mendelssohn. And her father, Anton, said, stop. There are a lot of Nazis in this hotel. Just be careful. So um, it just goes to show the changing climate of the time. Just some other lovely photos as Letty in um, St Mark's Square in Venice, which the family found very perplexing and bewildering because of all the back streets. I'm pretty sure they're not alone in that. Anyone that's been to Venice, nothing has changed. Um, they were overwhelmed by the magnificence of St Mark's Place. 
uh, but they did find the presence of black shirts on the streets very worrying. And by the time they got to Austria, Letty was very, very um, upset the way that uh, Jewish people were being treated and the fact that there were swastikas in every window. And the, Anton had hoped to take the family into Russia, but he couldn't get a visa and it was refused at every turn. So he decided that he would, he was very disappointed. He decided that they would not go through Germany uh, into Warsaw, so they, they returned to London. Um, and just a little anecdote that both he mentioned and, and, uh, and Stanton mentioned is that uh, a, an army captain fell asleep with his head on Anton's shoulder, which he found very unnerving. Uh, and people wandering around with knives at their belts in, in the army. So uh, things had changed a great deal by the time they returned from America on the SS Monterey. Um, and, you know, look, standing in uh, Sri Lanka, um, Anton commented that the Nazi emblem was being boldly displayed with no attempt to um, hide. It was painted on all ship's sides. So it just goes to show that when they started their trip, they felt very safe, but by the time they returned home, that things were starting to change. They'd been away for eight months. And there they are on the SS Monterey. Now, um, Letty's war service, um, she worked at a creche and kindergarten centre in Fortitude Valley. She also wrote songs for the Sunday Variety concerts entitled Smokes for Six Soldiers, compared by Wilson Irving, um, and she wrote some of the songs she wrote were things like V for Victory, Until You Come Marching Home. Letty also composed music for radio plays on 4BC with songs such as Sailing Into the Sunset, Because of You, and I Put My Hands in My Pockets. And um, I've read several reviews in newspapers just saying, watch this girl, this young girl, because she is writing music that is very um, sophisticated. She married Stanton in December 1941, when he was home on leave uh, from the war. And I love this photo. Jill was born on the 29th of August in 1948. Now, in 1945, Letty wrote Never Never. She entered the Australian Song Competition for the Federation of Australian Broadcasting Stations. It won the popular section, which she was rather amazed at, uh, because she felt it was a ballad. Um, but it, it's become um, standard in the ballad section. Uh, she said she didn't write really about love. She wrote more about other moods. And she's quoted saying that in quite a few newspaper articles. It was very difficult to get Australian music published, but the amount of radio play for Never Never meant that Chapel Sydney offered to publish it. It's been issued in choral arrangements, which forms choir repertoire, and some of you may have sung it um, if you've ever been in choral at Stedfords. Um, she wrote to Anais Gunn, because uh, she was a great letter writer, who, who sent back that Letty was a good lass. Um, of course, Anais Gunn, I should mention, wrote We of the Never Never. Um, Letty's composition, so um, it, with a town like Alice, um, she was invited to go to Sydney to play for the opening um, of the movie the premiere of the movie. Now, she, uh, this is 1954, she had already um, written the song before the movie was made. So um, that, that was thought to be a very good opportunity for some publicity for the publishing of the music. So she, she was flying down there and look at this crowd. She played before the premiere and after the premiere and this beautiful grand and she was absolutely tickled pink, to quote Letty. Um, she was very, very pleased with the way things turned out and we'll just hear a little bit of the song. So um, Alberts 
had chosen that very, very cleverly, I think, to promote the publication of her music. Um, it's the first Australian song with lyrics and music on the hit parade. Uh, lyrics and music written by an Australian and certainly lyrics and music written by a woman. Uh, it was immensely popular. Uh, it never, never was popular, but this, because it was on the hit parade, there was a lot of coverage uh, about, which I'll show you in a moment, about the headlines that she garnered. And here's Letty signing autographs. Um, yes, as I say, she was tickled pink and thrilled that, that she'd been afforded this opportunity. Housewife writes songs. <laughs> she writes songs, lyrics in the bath composers hit tunes. Um, so as you can see, that wife may hit hit parade is one of my favourites. So, so basically, um, the descriptions of Letty uh, in, in the preambles to all these articles are attractive, five foot one, bubbly blonde. Attractive, five foot one, blonde. Attractive, it just, but, but the five foot one, I love the way they're so specific. Um, because Letty actually was very attractive, as you can see, and she had done a bit of modelling. So, um, you know, it just seemed to be, I think she took the opportunity to, um, to promote her work and I found that very much the hallmark of Letty Katz, that she wasted no time in promoting her work and, and pursuing um, excellence within her work. Uh, so at this time it, it was, you know, there's a woman getting headlines on the hit parade and it was, it was a very big deal. I have to show you this, it's her day book. Uh, now, this was probably written in 1944, I think. So in, with this book, I looked at it and thought, what is this? It, she's, she had written in a book, she numbered every page, and then she wrote um, from the top to the bottom, things like um, complete list of compositions, all written by hand. Um, I love the fact that she has opportunities, competitions, people to follow up. And on every, you know, you, sure enough, you flick forward to page 27, then there it is. She has written in, you know, what opportunities that she can follow. So this, this was very much her. She was a very thorough and meticulous person. Um, oh, here's the letter from Chapels saying that um, it had been, her um, music had been recorded um, and uh, Richard Collett and Bob Gibson's orchestra and they were very thrilled to, be, to say that um, that had been uh, put onto vinyl. And also the letter from Chapel um, congratulating her for her um, success with Never Never and that they'd sent her 10 pound, 10 shillings uh, as a, you know, for future earnings just to, to, I think, hold their place. Now, being Letty, this is Letty's account book, once again, it's extremely thorough. And she has got, I think she started this in um, 1944. And if you look down to about the third, because I'm blind, I can't really see very well, but because of the light, but I think it's the fifth entry, you will see 10 pounds, 10 shillings. 100 pounds she won for winning um, the songwriting competition um, for Never Never. Um, so, you know, she meticulously kept this ledger um, the, the one ledger, everything was in the one ledger until uh, December 1987, and then she started, um, <laughs> much to my interest, writing on bits of paper and putting them in into other books. So I hunted down all her <laughs> all her earnings, but she was very, very thorough, and I really think that that is commendable. She certainly kept track of her music. Um, and before I go into this slide, I must just mention that. Uh, in one of the piece of correspondence, she has alerted, I think it's to her agent, would you please follow up? They've been playing my music in France, never, never, and gave details. And the agent went, oh, sure, Letty. Um, how did you know it was being played in France? She never answered. She had her methods, though, obviously. <laughs> so, um, you know, I really admired her because she kept track of her music and she wasn't taken advantage of. Uh, now, this is... Um, another interesting slide because um, Graham Kennedy um, had asked her, well, it's a little story that Graham Kennedy showed Letty and the family were on holiday in Melbourne and they thought it would be a great idea um, to 
you know, to go and watch Graham Kennedy's show. And they turned the cameras on her and played Never Never. And then Graham Kennedy, being the sort of person he was, said, oh, you want to write me a song for my show? And she said, OK. So she promptly went home and wrote This Old Town and sent it to him. And <laughs> quite quickly, really, there was a quick turnaround. And he, he wrote back to her going, great, well, I'll be doing... Um, a medley of your music, and he sang it. And if you look at the slide, it says, stop press, it's already been done. So, you know, that was Letty. If you wanted something up, sure, I can do that for you. She also wrote um, um, This Is Sydney that Barry Crocker recorded. So, you know, she, was, she wasn't a person that messed about. If you, she, she could easily write tunes, like really good melodies. And if you heard me singing that song, it just gets in your head and you can't stop singing it. Um, and here's a, another interesting um, slide. Um, this is from Neville Shute. She started a correspondence with him and she, she wanted to write uh, music for On the Beach and she wanted to make sure it was all right with him. And he said, oh, I, you know, sure, sure you can. Uh, and she also sent me the music for Never Never and Town Like Alice and he... You know, that, that's just a, a little bit of the correspondence. You know, she was a great correspondent. She loved writing to people and they loved writing back to her. Um, and here's, this is in 13th of April, 1988. This is a list of her songs that are lodged with um, APRA, the Australian Performing Rights Association. So I think, if you have a look, of course, being Letty, it's all written by hand and in alphabetical order, with comments, but I've just uh, reduced it down. Um, one of them was an arrangement for Elise, Beethoven arrangement, and also um, uh, she had a Chopin arrangement, the waltz in um, C sharp minor. So very, as I say, a very thorough person. Um, and I do love this picture, it's Letty and Jill and playing two pianos and also duets. Um, she was, as I say, she was a woman that really looked after her music. She, she kept track of her, I won't say product, but she kept track of her creative product. Um, I'll just mention that the way that she started teaching herself to write music, I find found very interesting as well. She also played by ear. And she would come home and pick out tunes on the piano and, you know, work out bass lines. And then one day she said, I've heard her interviewed talking about this, I might just try writing something myself. And she thought it sounded okay. So she, she wrote it down and she started her little list of songs. And, and, yep. and, that, and the library has a lot of her music that's unpublished, written by hand or, you know, with the ideas sort of scribbled down, must get back to this. So that's how she actually started um, writing. And then she decided she should look at successful songs and just pull them apart to see what components made them successful. So she then, you know, she didn't, certainly didn't copy them, which was very quick to point out, but she looked for how the music, did it go up or down, or did it have, what sort of intervals was it using, what made it a hit song? Um, and she, that she put that experimentation to her own music. Um, in later years, she studied composition with Dr. William Lovelock, the first director of the Queensland Conservatorium. And they had a, a very warm relationship and have read some very funny letters that they've written to each other. Um, so she was a member of Songwriters Association, Victoria. She was a fellowship of Australia, in the Fellowship of Australian Composers. She was a member of the Australian Music Centre. Um, she regularly went to Sydney to follow up on um, her music and how it was being, you know, she'd go in and visit people and just make sure that things were ticking along. Um, I mentioned her love of correspondence. Um, she, as I said, Anais Gunn, who wrote um, We Are The Never Never. She wrote to Neville Shute, Peter Finch. Um, she wrote to him saying, you know, how much she loved uh, his performance and he wrote back saying, oh, thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Um, Graham Kennedy, uh, so like, you know, quite a long standing correspondence. Also, she made frequent appearances on Australia All Over, compared by Ian McNamara. And he and his wife, uh, there were lovely letters and cards 
um, swapped between the families. And they, when they were in Brisbane, they'd come and visit Letty and Stanton. Um, Hugh Lunn also, uh, and his wife were, were friends with Letty and Stanton, the first time he met her. Now, Hugh Lunn wrote Over the Top with Jim. He kissed her and he said, now I can say I've kissed an Australian icon. I don't know how impressed Letty was about that. She was quite modest. Um, I asked at the beginning, who was Letty Katz? Um, I'd just like to offer some quotes that have uh, from Letty. Some of them, I mean, this is her talking to herself in her diary, and I thought you might enjoy hearing her thoughts. It's 1951. She's on a ship. I wore my new grey suit, a black tam, tam shade, and accessories. It was pretty warm, but I was going to new, wear my new grey suit or die. 1974, I had rice bubbles and tea for breakfast. These fascinating details might be of interest about 20 years hence. I can't think why. Well, Letty, it's much later and I was very interested. <laughs> this would have to be the worst diary in the entire world that I've ever written, but at least the facts will be down for someone. One, <laughs> one particular windy trip to Sydney, she said, oh, the wind's like the Hound of the Baskervilles, it nearly blew me over. And my favourite letter is, I'm keeping count of calories. Those cashews, you know, were six calories each. Who was Letty Katz? Well, I hope I've opened a door to, to show you the woman behind the music. Uh, a woman who, at a time when Australian writers were not, and composers were not on the hit parade, here was a woman writing words and music, top of the hit parade, and I think it was for 11 weeks. Um, she was also a woman, by her own words, who loved wallowing in bookshops. She loved buying music. She loved reading. She loved buying horoscope books. She loved cooking cabbage rolls. I've got the recipe. Uh, she loved going to health food shops. Loved reading in German. Her joy was composing, painting. I've seen quite a few of her paint, um, you know, her, her works that Stanton has. She loved writing. She loved playing the piano. But most of all, she loved her family. Here she is, looking young and beautiful, and also looking old and quite satisfied with life. So I commend you to play some of Letty's music. Have an explore, have a listen to it, because really she mythologised the bush and, and brought it to city people. And that's what you know, I think is a joyous thing about her music. She wrote many, many songs for children and duets. And as her kind of music, her ballads, well, they fell from popularity, she, she wasn't deterred. She went, all right, I'll move into writing uh, duets for people to play. I will write children's music and write beautiful, you know, A Day in the Bush with all the, the young children. So she, uh, she was not daunted um, by, um, you know, time passing. She, she persisted, and I loved that about her. I've become very fond of Letty Katz, and I know that I have laughed so loudly at times I've startled people in the other room reading some of her comments, which I won't share with you, but some of them are absolutely hilarious because she's just writing to herself. But, you know, diarists, what, what a wonderful thing to have all her diaries to read. It formed a picture of the life that women lived across that time period. So I'd like to thank you all for listening and I'd also like to thank um, Stanton and Jill and Sally for offering me the opportunity to do this work and, and thank you very much State Library of Queensland for the opportunity to have a lovely time in the, the room. <laughs> thank you very much for listening. Thanks very much, Narelle. Um, hi, I'm Gavin Bannerman. I'm the Director of Queensland Memory here at State Library of Queensland. And I think um, it's such a great presentation. Thank you, Narelle. Um, but this is your opportunity to ask questions and ask those things which you've been like, oh, I want to know about this. Oh, there's this fascinating bit of Letty's life which I want to know more of. So we'll encourage people to um, contribute if they can through the Slido platform. So there's a QR code, which, like 
three years ago, we, we were so hard to get people to use a QR code. Now it's like second nature for everybody. So um, that will direct you to the link and you can just put um, questions in through that. Um, also, just remind people that we're recording this session and if there's anybody that you know unable to make it tonight, um, there'll be a full recording that they can um, view at their leisure as well. I've just got a few questions to kick it off. I know yes. it can be intimidating to, to ask the first question. Um, but I just, I'm amazed, um, I'm an archivist, so I'm always interested in people's personal collections. Um, but just like how well ordered that is as a personal archive. I, I can't think of many that are so meticulous and just, you know, indexing your own personal you know, diaries and ledgers and what was it, the opportunities, you know, yeah, market opportunities. I loved opportunities. opportunities. You know, it's, it's very earnest. Like, what was the experience of looking through that, that personal collection? Well, I have worked on archives before with the Queensland Conservatorium and um, it was, I found it extraordinary. Um, I was blown away when I, I opened, opened up the, the box and it, this little, little book came out. She was obviously, I, I think, Letty, the thing that made me then and there think, wow, this is amazing, is the fact that she, from the outset, decided that she was going to pursue what she loved, and that was um, composition. And she, she followed people up. Like, she, she'd send things into um, um, the ABC, and they'd say, oh, yes, that's interesting. Would you like an orchestrated version of it? Which, you know, it's like... <laughs> So she, she, she was very um, uh, directed from a young age, I think. She knew what she wanted to do. I mean, coming from that background, like that comment that Stanton made about Letty was a true aesthete, I think that that was formed, her, you know, her background formed the person she was, of course. Um, being exposed to music, all, you know, travel, seeing all that kind of performance. Oh, I should have mentioned that whenever the Russian ballet was in town, of course, Letty's father was Russian, so they would, um, you know, they'd go to the ballet and, you know, they'd, they'd be chatting to them. So she had this high level exposure from a young age, but she also had inherited the musical ear of both her mother and her father. It seems like it was a really rich upbringing of just different cultural influences. You know, it's not growing up in, you know, early 20th, 20th century Brisbane, it it's cosmopolitan in a different kind of way. She's exposed to these different sort of influences. Does she talk a little bit about how that upbringing through her archives influenced her outlook on life? Um, she, she didn't really talk about it specifically. It was very a given. It was very matter of fact. That was, I suppose, that was just her life. Like um, talking about the Russian ballet, it would be a little asterisk and a note. Mm. Um, tea, Russian ballet. <laughs> mm. um, it's interesting, I mean, as r relatively recent emigre, um, and I don't know, I've seen in other family histories, it's like you try and piece together, like that's, that's a fairly wealthy thing to do, to be able to travel around the world. And, you know, so it, it, is it, I sp and that time in Brisbane was hierarchical in a lot of ways. How did she fit in with that sort of pecking order of Brisbane at the How time? How did Letty fit in? Yeah. Um, well, the thing I found really interesting was the fact that, yes, yeah, she did travel around the world. Um, the fact that this magnificent house, was, Art Deco house, was built. It had maids' quarters as well, mm. three toilets, um, two bathrooms, and this extraordinary garden. I'm, once again, there's no sort of discussion about that. It was just, I just went, wow. Um, I don't know how she fitted in. She went to Somerville House. I have spoken to a couple of people that said that she was unusual. Um, and maybe that's why she was very, um, I mean, she thought about music a lot. And so say she carried her satchel and she was a really spankingly good musician uh, from a young age. So there's no sort of mention that it was e extraordinary. I mean, having, having read everything she's written, she, she was very dry in mm -hmm. her writing. Um, I mentioned something to Jill about uh, her diaries that she and Stanton were on, on, um, away in London and it was at the time when Heathrow had been bombed. And also there was the Libyan embassy 
uh, Siege, and she said, oh, I thought there was something going on in the roof. I think we'll eat in tonight. <laughs> and I, I said, and yeah, Jill said, that's mum. Yeah. 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 So, you know, she, she didn't... Overstated. Yeah, she didn't overstate it. She was, she was fairly uh, undercut things. But. Yeah. But probably one last question from me, and, and I think it's an interesting period of um, Australian and Queensland music to analyse because, you know, a decade later, um, you know, the beginnings of the rock and roll generation and, you know, I think we're quite good in Australia about celebrating and acknowledging that period and onwards of Australia's music history, but it's this sort of interesting between, you know, after post-war sort of period which the influence you can see in the pictures how big a deal she is but there's that strange kind of disconnect of discourse and acknowledgement of that happening did you was that a motivation yes well look honestly um i think that following the war people were exhausted and there's something about letty's writing that's beautifully as i said she mythologized the bush this idea of being out in the country um you know travelling around with these, um, these notions of, of, of what Australia is. And, you, you know, when you think about it, a town like Alice is 1954, now we're well in that period, in the 50s, where you've got popular music. Um, and here's Letty sitting on number one on the hit parade. I found it, yes, I did find it extraordinary, and I wondered, because this notion of, you know, the idyll, what, what do we want? We want to forget all the pain and the suffering. We want something that's, that's the myth of what we were before. Yeah, so I think that um, perhaps that, that has something to do with it. But it is, it is unusual, and I think she was quite struck by the fact she had written a ballad with Never Never and then um, Town Like Alice um, that, that had succeeded. But she just took it in a stride, you know. I'd never seen the list of all of the song titles put up on a screen like that before. Uh, you know, obviously was aware of the more popular songs, but just that recurring theme of fauna and flora through the yeah, songs. Yeah, and it, that, it is the bush. It's, it's an interesting... Um, was that unusual or was that something she was particularly trying to bring out? Through I think that she was really attracted to it, although she didn't really go to the country very often. <laughs> she loved the idea of it. Everyone uh, you says know? Mac is not really a country person anyway as well. Exactly. <laughs> but, um, yeah, she, it's, it's that notion of what is Australia, uh, mm. you know, and, and Letty coming from a very interesting background. I mean, her mother, well, I think she classified herself as a fourth-generation Australian on her mother's side. So um, it's quite fascinating. And I, I, as I said, it's that I, I notion of, of something idyllic um, that is almost lost. It, it's this beautiful time period. I might um, move on to one of the submitted questions. So thank you, Jody, um, for asking this question. It's a, it's, a, it's a good one and I think probably a, a good reflection of the rule book on how to be a mother, how to balance a career, how to be a successful artist. You know, there wasn't sort of, um, you know, these influences telling us how to do things. She was, ma you know, making it up. Did you want to talk um, about the, were there any sort of um, demonstration of the challenges she faced um, on the basis of her being female and also being a mother? Thanks, Jodie. <laughs> um, it, yes, I did, I did look at this and I, I would like to look into this further. Um, when people asked her about her writing, um, she kind of downplayed it and said, oh, I, when I'm lying in the bath, that's when I come up with my ideas. Um, there was no, it, it was no, it, she, she called it, and she'd been writing songs for a while, like she'd been writing songs, I think, for five years. So since 1939, probably before then. Um, and she said, oh, it's a, it's a lovely little hobby to have. Now, I don't know whether that is because that's the way it should be viewed, that she was, had to get, direct her attention to her uh, being a mother and wife. But honestly, she seemed to juggle it really well without making a fuss. And she just kept writing music, as you saw by all those songs. Um, that's not all of them, by the way. They're just the ones that were, were registered with APRA. She had written well over 100 songs. And there's half-written songs, there's ideas for songs. I should have mentioned she always wrote her own lyrics with two exceptions. Uh, once was for, uh, I think it was the centennial um, for... 
I think it was St Andrew's Church, I hope that's right. And the other one was a, a little boy sent her some lyrics and said, would she set it to music? And she did, she wanted to encourage him. So apart from that, she always wrote her own lyrics. Um, so she, you know, here she is writing s songs, music, and bringing, you know, daughter, I mean, you saw the picture of Jill with her uh, sitting at the piano when she was a child. Jill also learnt music from a young age. Um, I think that it must have been an amazing house, both when Letty was young and then, you know, um, Stanton, Letty and Jill would have been formidable in their um, intelligent discussion, I think. They would be an amazing group of people. So, yeah, I, I, it's something to look into. Uh, look, I thought that I'd like to talk more about Letty at conferences maybe and talk about gender because I think she did an amazing thing writing this song um, and getting onto the, you know, the, top, the top of the charts as a woman um, in a time where rock and roll was just starting to happen. And mm. it's very interesting. I mean, just seeing the press reporting of, you know, her height and her, you know, physical appearance and that sort of thing. Do you think she um, sort of was able to navigate things for her advantage or was she, um, you know, she was just in the place and the time and place that she happened to be living and she was just doing the best she could to, to further her work? Well, uh, you know, I tend to think that Letty used her opportunities and she was a very attractive woman and, you know, she had done modelling, as I said, her face was well known, she was in the papers quite a lot. Um, and I, look, I, I, would, I would speculate, looking at the way that she has, um, you know, pursued her um, music, um, that, that, you know, one would hope that she had twisted the media around to her advantage. <laughs> um, there's a good question um, about the house. Do, do you know anything about the house? Well, I went, oh, look at that house, and Jill sent me the plan, so I was obsessed. And, you know, I was like, look, at the, I, th I thought it was, I said, I thought I was looking at the botanical gardens, and it was, no, it's their house. Um, so, yes, I looked on Google, and there it is. It's still there. And I thought I might take a drive by at some stage <laughs> to have a look because um, uh, I, I think it was, must have been sold at some stage, but it still looks fairly much the same. Oh, well. uh, the garden could look a bit better, but I, Did I'd they like to look at the... the yeah, well, that's what I'd like property, to yeah. see. It, it was a huge, it looked like a huge block of ground. So I will look further into that, but the house is still standing, which in these days is a miracle. It's amazing. Um, there's the discussion about she did a whole lot of different work um, in lots of different um, sort of ways to um, adapt and respond to opportun opportunities, to use that word. Um, she took the opportunity to write for radio plays. Um, uh, Noven, apologies if I mispronounced your name, um, just has a question about do you have any more information about those radio plays? Um, well, I do have a couple of scripts, but I can't remember the name of them, shame, at this point in time. I, look, I think that they, they were a weekly thing um, and she had, I think she even acted in some of them. Um, I think it was 4BH that, that, that was um, producing them. So, um, and of course she just put her hand up and said, oh, I can write some music for that. Um, so look, she wrote quite a, quite a few songs. So um, I can look further into that. I do have one script floating around, but. I just can't remember the name of it, I'm sorry. It is an interesting, uh, it's that sort of oxymoron of broadcast, whether it's for radio or television, they often stick so much in our mind, but be because of the ephemeral nature of it, like it, very little is ever retained of what's broadcast. Yeah. So you kind of have this sort of like, is kind of like lingering memory which is sometimes difficult to, to pin down. To pin with, down, yeah. Um, I, I do those. have uh, one script which is very much of the time. Um, but yes, I, I think they were, you know, produced quite quickly, um, recorded and the, the, I found it interesting that she had written music for these radio plays as well, like taking opportunities. How do you, I was curious how you think Lady, uh, it's a bit bit of a conceit but how she would go in a modern context like she's obviously so talented her diaries read like tweets the way that you're sort of 
reading them out, they've got that sort of, she's like self-questioning her, you know, they've got that kind of like tone to them. Yeah, they do. Um, I think Letty would be brilliant right now. I had this conversation with Catherine. I think that if Letty was here now, she would be a sensation. Now, you know, who knows what she'd be doing. I'm sure she'd be composing, performing. Uh, she'd be Triple using threat. every opportunity yeah. <laughs> to, be, to be seen and heard. Uh, and yeah, I think that certainly um, mm. she, she is, as you say, the, her comments are both hilarious and reflective. Um, which, which I also loved. I mean, she's quite self, she's critical of herself. Uh, I didn't read out all the comments she made, um, but you know, quite critical of herself at times. Um, but yes, but she, she, there was one wonderful moment where she met this young man, uh, the Australian Music Centre, and he said, oh, oh, are you Letty Katz? Can I have your autograph? And she said, oh, oh, do you know me? And he said, oh yes, we sang, our choir sang. Um, all your musical arrangements. So I, and she said, it gave me such a cheer and a boost. I went home in a cloud. So, you know, she was pepped up uh, because, you know, this was in a time sort of, um, would, would have been the 80s when it was getting harder and harder to, for opportunities. But, you know, she just was that person. She, she turned around and made the best of it, which I loved. She does seem like she was still quite active um, even after the, the, probably the height of her fame concluded and was quite generous in mentoring and supporting other musicians. Like um, I remember Stanton um, telling a story of, it was just a, a school band or something like that performing in Queen Street Mall. And apologies, I'm not a musician, but she was, she said, no, you're on top of it, the, to the music, to the, to the these school yeah. children performing. And it was like, um, she always had an ear out and was always there to, provide advice and support the next generation? Was that something that yeah, came through? Yeah, absolutely. Her? She was extremely generous. Um, and, you know, she was always excited to hear new things. Um, it goes back to that, oh, she loved movies. She, she loved discussing books, you know, and was very, very generous with her uh, knowledge of music and very generous with, um, Stanton told me a story about, um, she was uh, selling her grand piano. And she spent time talking to this young boy and she said, oh, I think it'd be really lovely if, if, uh, if he was the one to get the piano. So, you know, she was extremely encouraging of the next generation. This is a big question. Um, and it's probably one which uh, depends on all of those things that are coming out of your research as well. But do you have any ideas how Letty should be remembered and acknowledged in Australia? Well, honestly, I started with the conceit of who is Letty Katz. And I, I, so I've got a few ideas, of course. Um, I thought that I would like to go around and maybe talk at libraries or historical societies, um, certainly conferences. Uh, but I also think it would be, I'd, I'd like to write uh, a book about Letty. I think it, she deserves her place in the Australian um, music scene. And I think that, it, you know, that's a project that I'm very interested in. Um, she's a person that, that needs to be remembered and celebrated um, for, her, for her compositions, for her attitude to um, life, for, for the way that she, as a young girl, just went, OK, this is what I want to do. Uh, you know, composition, it's not the, e it's not the, the easiest thing, um, particularly in this time period, writing popular music. So that's... That would be, um, you know, a great thing. I'd really love to do that. Um, if the family are happy with me to do that, <laughs> I'd love to. Well, it'd be a great legacy for your research. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd really like to, you know, for people to go, oh, Lady Cats, of course I know about her. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it is um, part of what we do here at State Library of Queensland, we try and, um, shine a light on those figures which are worthy of more attention and um, bring those stories which people should connect with and learn more about to a broader audience. So thank you so much for um, your generosity, your excitement and that enthusiasm which comes through in your presentation. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Gavin, and thank you very much for coming and thank you once again for this opportunity. It's been wonderful. Good round of applause.
Now, that's not all. Um, we've got, uh, we, we're, we're hitting um, the, the season for research presentations here at State Library of Queensland. Um, we have two more um, presentations coming up. One is on the 9th of February. Um, uh, so this is the research outcomes from fellows from 2020. Um, we offer a range of research opportunities for people to delve into the collections of State Library. And one of those people is Dr. Alison O'Sullivan, who's been looking at uh, diaries from women in colonial Queensland, and will be giving a presentation synthesising that research. We're looking very forward to that because she's been um, uncovering a lot of things which uh, has shone a new light and brought out things that we were um, didn't know that how exciting and how um, important they were for the collection. So um, that's on the 9th of um, February at the same time as same format as tonight. Um, people will be able to view that um, through the Facebook stream and the live stream and all of the sessions will be recorded as well. And then uh, on the 16th of February, sorry, I'm probably moving um, ahead. There's also the presentation on um, uh, the Great Barrier Reef and the great work that two women did to, uh, that uh, one woman did to um, to do the work to advocate for the uh, Great Barrier Reef and then the great research that two women have done to um, interpret that research. So that is uh, on the, that's a week after, so that's on the 16th of um, February 6 to 7 um, in the same auditorium and that's presenting um, the research of uh, I just need to get the, the prefixes right, the, the doctors and the associate professors. The Dr um, Deb Anderson and associate professor Carrie Foxwell Norton will be presenting that research um, on the Great Barrier Reef, the untold stories of environmental conservation movement in Queensland. So um, I hope you've um, had an interesting and in, uh, insightful night. Um, we will also, I'll just quickly um, let you know that the opportunity to apply for the Letty Katz Award for 2022 will um, present itself um, in this calendar year. So stay tuned to the usual um, channels, social media, the website um, and uh, email distribution lists for, um, for when that opportunity arises. But I'd just like to thank Noelle again for her enthusiasm and contribution to history in Queensland. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Thanks so much and have a great night.